when I tell people, you know, the sort of cocktail party situation, if I tell people that I study, uh, that I'm a psychologist, that I study personality, the, the very first thing that they ask me is, uh, are you are you analyzing my personality right now? Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Anyway, I, I, so I, I usually lie and say no. <laughs> I mean, of course, I'm analyzing your personality, right? I mean, that's what we—that's what humans do. We analyze each other's personalities yeah. when you, know, you talk to someone. You know, I'm probably just a little bit more qualified to do it than the average person. Yeah. <laughs> are we? Yes. Where are we? Here. Why are we here? Not entirely clear. We are misfits thrust into existence by random chance with no hints at all as to how we're supposed to make sense of it all. It's immensely bizarre. Here we are. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Here We Are podcast. This is my third time doing this. We just fixed some internet connection issues, and now I am truly excited because I'm pretty sure we're going to nail it this time. Uh, this is a return guest. Uh, he's been on, uh, here we are. He was on one of the few ever, I think the first ever, and I only did a couple live here we are recordings because I ended up uh doing this show stand up science instead which he also did and he's been on a regular recording of here we are before i just love his work so much uh we've talked a bunch about personality research in the past i think the live recording that we did we we talked about new year's resolutions because it was uh early january and kind of how personality influences that and uh super memorable episode and just a great time every time we chat doing things remotely now makes things easy for when i have a past guest pop into my head for whatever reason be like oh dang i wonder what they're up to i can just email them i don't need to wait till i'm in their town on tour or whatever and so i re i emailed colin just the, the a couple days ago for no reason really he just popped into my head asked him what he'd been up to and he has some really cool research to share so thank you colin de young for joining me um today did I, what did I? Uh, that was a weird pronunciation of your name, Colin D. Young. What did I say? Sounded, sounded fun to me. Young. Okay. Um, can you, Colin? Can you um, one, uh, especially when you enjoy this episode, listeners, I recommend going back and hearing uh, hearing Colin um, talk on past episodes about some of his. Uh, it, it, I think we kind of covered more of the bulk of his main interests in the last episode that he was on. Um, but for those people that haven't heard you, Colin, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, so uh, I'm a psychologist and uh, I do psychological research, scientific research. I also teach. I'm an academic. I'm at the uh, University of Minnesota. Uh, I think a lot of people, when they hear the word psychologist, they think of somebody you go and tell your problems to, uh, like a therapist. I'm not a clinical psychologist. Um, but I do study some um, mental health issues in my research, and especially uh, links to personality, links between personality and risk for mental illness. And um, I have recently also been interested in going in the other direction in terms of linking uh, personality to well-being. Um, because after all, uh, just not having a mental illness is a pretty, well, hopefully it's a low bar. Uh, mm -hmm. And there's probably <laughs> a lot of variation in whether people are doing well or not, even if they don't have uh, mental illness. So I've started uh, applying some of my ideas about personality to the study of well-being. Fantastic. Uh, two wonderful topics that we talk about frequently on the show, or I, I don't, maybe not super frequently, but um, listeners that longtime listeners will know that there are topics that excite me, both personality research and well-being stuff. And everyone loves hearing about well-being stuff. And man, is there so much garbage out there, Colin. You go on social media and you're just bombarded with platitudes and life advice and all these things. And like, so I think I'm too hard on it sometimes. Hey, I, I often say that 
uh, much of life is about finding the placebo that works for you. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but uh, man, there there is you know there's there's a lot of room for grifting in the in the wellness domains. You go in the self help section of a bookstore or whatever, and some of the stuff it's like I don't know. I mean, if it works for you, fine. But um, but I'm I'm so excited to hear from your perspective because it kind it it in the in in skimming the paper it it looked like you combine a lot of the ideas that i i personally connect with now i'm like of course my way of thinking about <laughs> things is the is the correct way oh side note when you were mentioning the psychology the misunderstanding thing and yeah, I had another moment of snobbery the other day when I was I was playing pickleball and um, someone was someone was asked what they do and they're like oh I'm a psychology I I teach psychology and and then someone was like oh are you gonna fix my brain and I just cringed like oh that's what everyone thinks that must be the equivalent you must you guys must. Anyone that studies psychology must get that common misunderstanding in the same way that if you're a comedian, people think you really want to hear their street jokes, like the stuff right. that they read on the internet. <laughs> oh, man. That's probably even more painful than what we get. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say that when I tell people, you know, the sort of cocktail party situation, if I tell people that I study, uh, that I'm a psychologist, that I study personality, the, the very first thing that they ask me is, uh, are you are you analyzing my personality right now? Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Anyway, I, so I, I usually lie and say no. <laughs> I mean, of course, I'm analyzing your personality, right? I mean, that's what we that's what humans do. We analyze each other's personalities when you, know, you talk to someone. You know, I'm probably just a little bit more qualified to do it than the average person. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. Uh, I lie and say no. Yeah. Um, and then yeah. the, other thing that, the other thing they ask me is, uh, so can I change my personality or like, can I change my boyfriend's personality? You know, like they, they want to, people are really interested in personality change. And hmm. that's actually, it's not something that I study a lot, but it is something that my field, personality psychology in general, has gotten really excited about in the last, oh, I don't know, 20 years or so. There's just been a huge surge of research on personality change. Really? Would you, and, and we don't have to dwell on this subject that isn't your research, but um, would but you it's say certainly that relevant a, to rel It's certainly relevant to yeah. well-being, right? Because, we, you know, uh, we can talk about this, but obviously people's personalities provide, uh, you know, risks for you know, right. lacking well-being. And so if you can change it, that might improve well-being. Well, so, yeah, we can talk uh, about it. Yeah, great. So is there is there much cause for optimism? I I ask. <laughs> I well, I ask because I have there's there's a lot there's a lot about myself that I like and I'm not, you know, terribly motivated to change. There's there's sometimes where I'm like you know, maybe I could be like kinder to people on social media or something. My my low agreeableness really shines through if you follow me on Twitter or something. But but outside of that, um, I'm I'm mostly happy with who I am, except I'm so low in conscientiousness and it's such a detriment to my life. It 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 really it makes my life hard. It makes relationships hard. It makes um my it makes financial obligations hard, you know, instead of paying the $20 parking ticket on time, I wait till there's a bill collector, right, you and know. Now it's a $200 get, fine. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And uh and I'm I'm messy. I also got away with so much because I was living on the road. I was living out of Airbnbs and hotels and so so I never had to pick up after myself and now being in one place for over a year for the first time in like 17 years i'm like oh i am such an incredible <laughs> slob this is revolting and i look at it every day and i'm like this is awful this is like what what does this say about me <laughs> as a person and i and i really struggle um, so it would be lovely to hear that there's, that there's uh, some 
uh, wiggle room because because you do a lot of you do a lot of uh, stuff from a neuroscience standpoint from throwing people in MRIs and taking a look at their their noodle and getting down to the nitty gritty of uh, of this particular region doing this and, and researching personality traits that way. Right. Yeah, I do. Um, I do a lot of what we call personality neuroscience. So, yeah, scanning people's brains and then looking to see how different aspects of brain structure and brain function are connected to their personality traits. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, so you might wonder how changeable these things are. Um, of course, the fact that something is generated by the brain doesn't mean it's not changeable, right? Because our brains can change. And since everything is generated by the brain, like if our personalities change, our brain has to change too. Um, I think people often get confused about the difference between something being genetic and something being biological. Right. Um, and we know that personality has a genetic influence on it. Your genetics definitely helps to shape your personality. Um, but it's, you know, it's certainly not 100% of the variation in personalities that is due to genetic variation. So uh, our and environments different, different too. traits different traits kind of have different um uh kind of a different percentage of of that trait like how much it's shaped by genes or whatever like like uh, isn't narcissism isn't narcissism sort of toward the more genetic side of things for example uh no i would say that what we know about most traits at this point is that they're they're pretty they're fairly similar in the degree to which they're genetically really? influenced yeah oh that's cool um, yeah uh you know so it's important like that we distinguish between things that are really specific like you know how much you love spaghetti is probably not like genetically yeah yeah interestingly even mm -hmm. for things like that there's going to be some degree that your genetics shapes it right and we know this from decades of psychological research uh, using twins and now using actual DNA, that even something like how much TV you watched or whether you get divorced or how much, whether you like spaghetti, even that has some amount of genetic influence on it. Um, that is always so bizarre <laughs> when you hear those yeah. stories of the identical twins separated at birth, yeah. raised in drastically different families. And then, and, and they might in their adult life be like very different people in a lot of ways but then they'll have this very strange thing like like they both walk backwards into a pool in the deep yeah. end or like some very yeah. and strange it, it is literally thing that, like that specific right so there's this famous yeah. study that was actually run here in minnesota in, in the department that i work in um, of twins reared apart. So they basically went all over the world finding pairs of twins that had been separated uh, at birth or very soon after and put up for adoption in different places. Um, and yeah, they would find these just amazing similarities, like two guys who were both firefighters and drove the same model of car and uh, drove to the same stretch of beach in Florida every year for vacation and drank the same kind of beer and held the beer yeah. can in exactly the same way with their little pinky underneath <laughs> the bottom of the beer yeah. can. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and just all kinds of crazy stuff like that. So yeah, uh, genetics, but it's important to think about the way that that happens from genetics, because obviously there's no gene for liking Budweiser and there's no gene <laughs> yeah, yeah. for, uh, you know, uh, marrying somebody named Betty or driving a Chevy or something like that. Right. Right. So what's being shaped by your genes are these more kinds of basic personality traits that then have all these cascading effects that are, mm -hmm. you know, they interact with the way in which you encounter your environment uh, and what you how you react to the things that are just available in your environment. So, you know, of course, it mattered that those people were both growing up in those twins. They were both growing up in America, so they had the same kind of cultural options available. Right. They wouldn't yeah. have both drank the same kind of beer if one of them had been, uh, you know, adopted in, you know, Eastern Europe or something. Like yeah, that, right? right. So, um, but, you know, people get people get confused about what it means for things to be genetic, for things to be biological. People get worried when they you know, when they learn their genetic influences on these things because they think that they're not going to be able to change them. Um, but well, I I think it's also part part of it is sorry to interrupt, but I, I think a little bit of it is, is that it's so damn fascinating when you hear a story like that 
that you think, oh, it must be all genetic. And then you you kind of overestimate in your mind right. just because of that's such an exciting headline to read about, right. you know, and it, it does it does make me think like if you have if you're a parent and you end up having identical twins, I feel like I feel like if you're a good person, you should separate them at birth like for <laughs> science i i feel like oh, for science, i feel like right. you're i feel like you're holding back science if you don't separate your <laughs> your identical <laughs> twins well yeah, um, you know it happened it happened often enough that we got some pretty good science out of it you know i think now yeah. you can keep them together and let them develop their little twin languages and all the cool stuff that happens with like the you know mind reading between identical twins I guess we just need more identical twins, just generally speaking, apart sure. together, whatever. Um, but yeah, we can so, actually do a lot with them scientifically, even when they grow up together, right? because yeah. the fact that they're identical means that they share all of their genetics, and so we can compare them to, you know, fraternal twins uh, mm. who only share fifty percent, or regular siblings who only share fifty percent. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, so, so we were, we were talking about the, uh, kind of what you think the chances are for, um, wiggle for flexibility within, um, the, I imagine, I imagine mindfulness has something to do with it because you're, you're probably never going to change something that you aren't mindful of in the first place. Like if I don't notice that I'm a messy person what causes there to change right. it um and uh, so so there must be there's there's probably there's probably certain personalities that are also better at at tweaking their personality yeah yeah that's interesting um that you mentioned that um I don't, so I think we're in pretty early days of studying these sort of intentional interventions to try to change personality. Mm -hmm. Um, but people have for a while now been studying just pers natural personality change over people's lives. Um, and so there are certain like people who are, uh, who are lower in conscientiousness, lower in agreeableness, higher in neuroticism. They're more likely to have their personality traits change over time. Right. And so I think about that in terms of their being really? just generally less, they're generally less stable. And so that general lack of stability in the motivational and emotional and social domains uh, ends up also being associated with having their whole personality being a little less stable and more likely to change over time. Mm. Um, but wow. in terms of the, it, <laughs> that, that's, that's really interesting to hear. That's, huh because i would have thought that you're kind of just damned uh <laughs> you know yeah. it's it's well what i you, always tell people when they ask me like can you know can my personality change is that it, personality can change it does change we know that it changes but it doesn't usually change easily it doesn't change like hugely dramatically um doesn't necessarily change rapidly like you're not going to go from being uh, an extreme introvert to being an extreme extrovert Mm -hmm. um, you might go from being an extreme introvert to being like a bit less of an introvert, or you might go from being sort of somewhere in the middle to being, uh, you know, pretty extroverted, but you're not likely to see these huge, massive shifts, right? Like you're not likely to suddenly become the most conscientious person around. Um, mm -hmm. but at the same time, there are changes that occur over time. And so you might get a bit more conscientious. And I think you're right that mindfulness, especially if you if you want to change, and one of the things that this research has discovered is that people do want to change, right? So some of the, you might think, well, how do you study personality change? Well, one of the first things people studied was do people want to change their personalities? And lo and behold, mm. just about everyone wants to change at least one of really? their personality traits. Yeah. Huh. Nobody is entirely satisfied with their personality. Well, that's, that's kind of, uh, that's kind of good and sad at the same time. I mean, that's a, there's a double sided, it's great to be mindful. It's great to want to improve yourself. And then it's also, uh, a little discouraging to just never be satisfied with yourself ever. Well, like you said, that's why there's so much room for grift, right? Everybody wants to change. Everybody wants to fix themselves, right, whether it's, right. you know, physical health, obviously, but also mental health and personality and those things that contribute to well-being. 
I mean, certainly there are things that can happen. I, I mean, I've gone in streaks of my life where, you know, I just gotten just crazy good shape, you know, over the course of a year, it just got obsessed with, went from like zero to obsessed with exercising constantly in a very short time frame. Um, you know, didn't last forever, but it was pretty remarkable the change that was able to happen. And and th- that only ended because I broke my feet, which was another extreme thing. And then it was hard nice. to get back into after that. But then, um, but you know, getting into a relationship if I if I if I meet a girl, I haven't been up for dating during the pandemic. But if I um met a girl and my situation changed you know there's a lot more (laughs) there's a lot more pressure to pick up after my damn self and not be such a slob and i imagine there's there's probably factors in say a workplace or having kids or or something like that 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 kind of can be the catalyst for a little more dramatic change in in people's life yeah so it's cool that 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 was what your mind went to because there's been a lot of research in the last 20 years on whether there are things in people's lives that systematically provoke personality change. Um, and there have been a lot of like, oh, you know, maybe this, maybe that. And then when you kind of boil it all down and really review the research carefully, uh, it turns out that there are only two things so far that we have pretty good evidence that they are systematically likely to change people's personalities. One is getting your first job. Uh, and the mm. other is getting into your first uh, romantic relationship. Really? Yeah. It, kids? I would have guessed kids for sure. No, people have. St- yeah, that was a really strong hypothesis. There's been a wow. ton of research trying to see if having kids changes your personality. Um, and so far, there's not really evidence that it does. So, you know, huh. even if it does, it clearly doesn't change it a lot. But I think, you know, it's also important to think about what it means in this research for your personality to change. This research is usually studying these broad personality traits like the big five. It's not studying your specific habits, which you could argue are also part of your personality, right? They may be things that are really persistent about you over time. Uh, And so, you know, it's like you might still be a relatively unconscientious person, but you nonetheless get really good at, you know, (laughs) feeding your kids on time and getting them down to getting them down to sleep. Uh, on a good schedule, right? And so there is always this room for exceptions in our personality and for developing particular habits. Um, we use we we like to call them characteristic adaptations, which is kind of a, a clumsy mouthful, I guess. But um, uh, and I didn't invent that term, but it's a term that's used in the field. I like and it. Sounds so, good. Characteristic so, yeah, so, adaptations, right? And so the yeah, idea yeah. is that they're they're not your general personality traits uh, that are pretty directly shaped by your genetic background. They are ways that you've adapted to your particular life circumstances. So that's why they're called adaptations. Um, And then they're characteristic because they you can use them to describe someone. They're characteristic of that person. It's like you are a stand up comic, right? That's like that is a, a characteristic adaptation that you made to your life and it and it's worked for you. Right. And it, mm-hmm. it suited your personality traits and and you made it work and so that's like you know if you if you're somebody's asking you about what your personality is like you'd probably mention like yeah well i'm i'm a stand-up comic right Mm -hmm. um and so yeah uh, it it, it fits with like exceedingly high in openness and exceptionally low in conscientiousness is like it's a pretty good job you know i'm i'm conscientious enough to make flights on time right. and and then and then the low conscientiousness as a comedian you can kind of get away with being a a bit of a fuck up you know you get a lot of material out of it so it's right. it's a little bit of a, a of a way of monetizing my my flaws <laughs> Right. Well, and it means that you don't have a lot of respect for rules and regulations. Right? I feel like being right, a comic, right, you know, right. you, you need to be able to push the boundaries and um, right, right. not really be overly concerned with convention or what people think about you. Right. So. So might I ask, I, I was thinking about this very recently. I think this might have been why you popped into my head, actually. I was just thinking about personality research and I wanted to ask somebody 
when you're thinking about something like conscientiousness. So, so I think about, I've been thinking about the wellness community, um, quite a bit lately. Um, in, in because during the pandemic, during every pandemic through history, people, people have tended to be a little more health oriented generally, whether it's a respiratory virus or a waterborne thing or whatever, people just tend to, uh, you know, one of the silver linings is people start, you know, exercising more, doing it or eating better or whatever, um, depending on personality, of course, but that's been a general trend through history. But at the same time, um, I've noticed speaking of grifters, there's a lot of like grifters within the wellness community forwarding this or that as some cure all for you don't need a mask, you don't need a vaccine, you just need this dietary regiment and buy my supplements. Um, don't let big pharma take three dollars from you for a vaccine. Take my supplement that does nothing every single day. And and and, and that's not even when I say grifting, I guess I think a lot of it comes from a sincere place too. like a lot of a lot of people believe it themselves. But I I was just kind of thinking about the um, this is a time where we have a, a lot of uh, those two main stressors, lack of predictability and lack of control and a lot of learned helplessness, something I'm terribly familiar with, unfortunately, learned helplessness can, I think, I think the kind of conscious articulation of, of uh, learned helplessness um, can kind of sound like conspiracy theories and like a world plotting against you or whatever. But also there, there seems like, so I was thinking about people that are really high in conscientiousness and I was thinking, does, does that mean, so I was thinking that, that the appearance of you take two people that are exceptionally high in conscientiousness, they work out a bunch, they're very clean, they're on top of stuff, they're type A, one is maybe driven by, it's a habit. That's something that they're just really good at. They take too well. It's very natural for them. Another one is maybe high in conscientiousness because they have a, an exceptional need for control. And it's almost like a OCD type of thing or, or something. And, and, and I know a lot of people being in the psychedelic community, I know there's a lot of people in the psychedelic community that were like major fuck ups and then like tried to get their life together or whatever, and now are very high and conscientious, but, but it's because they weren't for a very mm -hmm. long time but as well. There's a, you've just given a great example of how people's personalities can change, right? So there, yeah, those are some yeah. people who were very unconscientious for a long time and now they've pulled it together and they are reasonably conscientious. Um, so, so I, I guess my specifically, I'm wondering how how you go about thinking about what drives a personality trait. So because when you say high in conscientious uh, conscientiousness, like I said, that might be coming from just a natural place or just a, someone's really adept at being organized. And it also might come from just a source of anxiety. But it's it looks from the outside as the same personality trait right. but it's two very different drivers and two very almost different personalities driving that personality right. trait well okay but so i guess the way i would think about this is that it can't be just anxiety right because there are plenty of people who have a lot of anxiety and they're unconscientious right? Me. So who worry, who worry <laughs> a lot about stuff and yet it somehow doesn't enable them to get organized and set their priorities yeah, effectively yeah. and get stuff done sure so you know, regardless of whether the anxiety is contributing to the need to feel like I've got to keep things organized and stay on top of stuff, there has to be something more that is enabling that conscientiousness to go on. And so I think the way that I would think about this is that, yeah, for any one of these personality traits, there are probably going to be slightly different influences for different people and essentially different interactions with the rest of the system. Um, mm -hmm. But then there's going to be some kind of a core that has to be there, that has to be going on in that person in order to have that thing at all, right? So in other words, it's not, so we take the person who's just always been conscientious and they might not even be a particularly anxious person. They just are really good at staying on top of things and being motivated and organized. Um, you know, so whatever their brain is doing to allow them to prioritize goals effectively uh, and to, you know, remember the things that they need to do and to, 
uh, you know, ignore distractions in favor of the long term. Uh, mm. The person who is conscientious after you know a lifetime of fucking up and then gets their gets their act together and becomes more conscientious. Well, think about what they have to be doing. They are still prioritizing their goals effectively. Uh, they mm -hmm. still have to be ignoring distractions. They still have to be, you know, focusing on the long term because if there's, if they're not doing those things, well, then they're just not conscientious, right? So right. there's got to be some system in the brain that is allowing you to prioritize your goals effectively. And that is suppressing, mm. like when something pops up and you say, Oh, I could do that instead of this thing that I'm supposed to be doing. Something's got to suppress that. Uh, <sighs> so, you know, most likely, <laughs> most likely, there is a lot of overlap in terms of the immediate drivers of conscientiousness for both of those people, even though their background and their motivations are quite different. Um, but then, yeah, you're certainly going to have a whole different profile of the way that that one system interacts with the other systems in the brain, right? Because for one person, it's constantly being uh, engaged by these jolts of anxiety, like, oh, crap, oh, shit. And so yeah. then that's, ki that's what's kicking that system into gear for them. Whereas for the other person, even without anxiety, for whatever reason, that system is just always in high gear. So, you know, yes, you can definitely see that there are likely to be differences in the way that the whole system acts as a whole. Yeah. Um, but I still like one of the basis of my work is the assumption, basically, or the, you know, the, the, the uh, proposition that there are likely to be these kind of core mechanisms that are there for each one of these broad personality traits uh, that we can identify in the brain. Hmm. Yeah. I, well, first off, I'm, I do this annoying thing all the time where I, I have the, the full intention of getting to the work that we're meaning to talk about of yours. Oh, and then I get so sucked me. in with the, the conversation that we're having. I have a zillion other mm -hmm. questions. The and conversations things, but... are just a bunch of connected tangents. I think the yeah, trick is, yeah. can, you get, can you get back from the tangent? I, so I absolutely your, your, your viewers are, you know, your viewers are going to revolt if we don't tell them about how, you know, wh whether they can intentionally change their personalities. So, right, so right. Yeah, we've been well, talking about conscientiousness and that's one of the, the two traits that people most often want to change are conscientiousness and neuroticism, right? They want to have less negative emotion and more, yeah, you know, more focus, more conscientiousness. No one, um, no one ever asked for more negative emotion. <laughs> uh, I've never heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, I mean, you, because I think the, the problem is if you're the kind of person who's, you know, like you're you're completely free of fear and anxiety, that might cause you some trouble in your life once yeah, in a while. You know, sure. you might get into trouble, but it doesn't occur to you to see like, I wish I was more anxious. You yeah, might just yeah, think right. like, you know. <laughs> well, it's it's funny that uh, uh, being being someone that um, I I don't know how much moodier I am than the average person. Um, I don't know. Bipolar is the case that they gave me, but I'm 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 sometimes skeptical of uh, labels and stuff. I've certainly had manic episodes, but um, but I do. I have periods of time where I work at a very high capacity for very long hours, day after day after day, um, for sometimes like an incredible lengths of time and like in, in not, and not like pushing it, like feeling good, like in a flow state, right. very creative, everything else. And then sometimes it all just falls apart and I just can't, uh, right. well, I mean, anything. that's very much like the description of that kind of bipolar pattern. Right. And we could yeah. have a whole additional conversation about yeah, yeah. why I think you should be skeptical of labels. Um, yeah. but that ability, you know, that tendency to just be focused and interested in really working hard on something, that's like, that's the, uh, the benefit to being higher in that risk for mania. Um, mm -hmm. so in the clinical psych world, we talk about hypomania as a personality trait. Um, and hypo means just under. And so it means like there are people who are a little bit manic. They don't have, they're not, you know, it's not like you're having a full blown manic episode, but yeah. you've got some of that that energy and that kind of positive feeling about things and that strong interest and drive and you know uh, if, you have, if you can have hypomania if you can have hypomania without spilling over into the like 
you know, where yeah. it really spirals out of it's control into, into full blown mania and you kind yeah. of lose touch with reality a bit, then, yeah. you know, hypomania is, can be great. You know, I, yeah. if, I, I wish I had a little more hypomania. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've I've had a few spillovers, but man, yeah. I've, I've had more often than not no spillover. So it's also just like a, it's a bit like a drug in a in a way where it's like an addictive feature. Like I can be aware that it's happening, but I well, I'm not turning this off. This is right, incredible. Right. Well, this is one of the reasons why even with full blown mania, it's often hard to treat people because it feels yeah. great. Like even when they're people around them can see that they're losing touch with reality and getting right, totally right. out of control. Like they just feel great. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you know, and that's, that's a, that's a function of dopamine. Basically mania is like mm -hmm. essentially dopamine overdrive. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for the same reason, it, connecting it to drugs makes a lot of sense because there is a pretty sound theory that the uh, core of all addiction is basically that the dopamine system gets overly entrained to pursuing that particular drug, right? Because oh, dopamine yeah. responds when something's rewarding. And so yeah. some drugs act directly on the dopamine system, like, you know, cocaine or amphetamine. And so that's just directly plugging into that uh, go system. But then even others, you know, that are acting in a different way, like, you know, opiates or alcohol or whatever, they are, the idea is that because they're rewarding, they're still triggering that dopamine system. And so it's that you're getting locked onto, I need to pursue that. Um, and so, yeah, it is having hypomania is like, well, I mean, let's say it's, a, it's associated with having an addictive personality, right? So, the, you know, they're like, like most extreme personality traits, there are pros and cons. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm super addictive person too. So that all makes sense. And I, I mean, I just view, I, I tend to view life as just lots of, uh, drugs. Like, I, I mean, I think like social media, TV, I oh, just yeah. think of everything like a drug. I, I, I don't, I don't differentiate between learning and drugs and addiction that much it's just like I, right well i, don't I mean know. your brain runs on drugs right your brain is full of various uh, naturally occurring chemicals and the right. things that we call drugs or psychoactive drugs anyway are precisely mm -hmm. you know we've discovered various substances that happen to interact with our with the drugs in our brain with our brain chemistry mm -hmm. usually they mimic drugs that are already in there naturally yeah and it's it's so the other thing with personality and and uh, and change is the seasonal change that happens for so many people. And and it's I don't know, it's 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 so before I was talking with you today, I would have thought that personality was pretty stable. And now as we're talking, the more I think about it, I'm like, oh, no, my I guess my personality changes like quite regular i have good weeks and bad weeks and right. i'm the, a little bit more of a especially things like outgoing um which it's it's also interesting the way these different personality traits interact with because if you're a, if you're say a little if you're if you're having some um more uh what is if you're a little more susceptible to negative emotional states um at a given time you might then also be less extroverted at that at that time yeah i think those things are likely to interact right so that if you are feel because anxious anxiety depression those generate inhibition um you know you're not Right. Uh, e even though they are, they, they vary separately, right? So you can have people out there who are high in that extroversion and neuroticism in the moment when you're feeling mm -hmm. you know, anxious or depressed or whatever is associated with neuroticism, you are definitely less likely to be acting extroverted. Mm -hmm. So they can vary differently in the population, even though they're a little bit more tightly connected with each other within your own experience and within your own change over time. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Uh okay, last last little thing on this subject before we get into this um paper, which is which is actually still related, but um uh we can we can edit this out if you want. Personal question. What what personality uh trait of yours would you like to change the most or do you think the most <laughs> about changing? Um well, this might surprise you, but for me too, it's also conscientiousness. Really? I also score quite low in 
conscientiousness. Um, and I, and so it turns out, so one of the things that uh, my personality model does is break those traits down into more detail. Um, and so uh, conscientiousness, you can divide into orderliness and industriousness. And uh. um, my, I would guess this is probably true of you too, based on your description, that my industriousness is considerably higher than my orderliness. Yes, yes, um, yes. You know, I, I get, I get a lot done. I, I work hard, but I didn't, I didn't, I used to have, I, they, they both used to be low. Uh, like when mm. I was a kid, when I was in high school, when I was in college, I was always late with assignments and not, you know, didn't, really? do, things, didn't do things on time and. You know, have to struggle at the last minute to. That's make so up reassuring for it. to yeah. hear, actually. Yeah. Well, something I tell my graduate <laughs> students if they're feeling stressed out uh, about the whole endeavor is that I got a uh, a C in behavioral neurobiology in college. Wow. Which you know, basically, is, uh, it's a lot like what I do now for a living. Um, but it, here, That's... here's what here's what the problem was. The problem was that I, I would go I go to the lecture on the first day first week a couple of times and i and i realize i'm looking at the textbook okay first of all the textbook was written by the professor who's teaching the class no, nothing wrong with that that happens all the time right he's been teaching the class for like 20 years he wrote the textbook great um and then i notice that he's on the board drawing figures to illustrate what he's talking about and he is absolutely line for line exactly recreating the the yeah. pictures that are in the textbook right and at that point i just thought to myself god i don't need to come to class i don't need to come to these yeah. lectures i'm just going to read because he's reproducing exactly what's in the textbook yeah. he wrote it he drew it apparently i, I don't you know i don't need to do this on an extra hour of free time and then, and then i'll just read the textbook before the exam only the problem is i didn't really get around to reading the textbook before the exam <laughs> yeah, <laughs> until yeah. you know like three days later, I'm thinking, oh, crap, I was trying, trying to get through this textbook and didn't go very well. Um, yeah, I always had so, the issue of taking my foot off the gas. I would always do well in the beginning. It's probably pretty common for a lot of kids to do well in the beginning of class and be excited or whatever. And then just kind of like uh, over it halfway through the. Yeah, well, you know, again, it depends. Like you're clearly someone who's driven by interest and by excitement and things, mm -hmm. you know, and so that's how you compensate for your low conscientiousness mm -hmm. uh, right you rely on that hypomania to get you through instead of the instead of the conscientiousness um but you know some people have are have trouble with conscientiousness in part as you were describing like because they're sort of anxious and inhibited and so like they might not mm -hmm. even get started at the beginning because they don't have the that drive and interest that that you had mm -hmm. but anyway for me what what happened was that you know i, I Things improved a bit as I as I went through college. By the end of college, I felt like I had things a little bit more uh, under control. But then I got to grad school, and it was a whole another story again because I realized, like, I just I was wasting so much time. There was there's this one my first couple of years of grad school. I just felt like how oh, I'm not getting enough done. Uh, I don't have the self discipline because this is the thing. Like you know. People go to, they, they do an undergrad degree and then they go into grad school and they think it's just going to be like more school. It's not mm -hmm. like school. It's not, it's more like an apprenticeship, right? You're learning a career and it's all very self-organized and self-motivated. Mm -hmm. um, and so for a lot, you know, and yes, you take some classes in a PhD program, but the classes are really secondary to learning how to do the research and actually doing the research and publishing scientific research, right? If you're doing a PhD in science, that's what's going to get you a job. That's what's going to get you a career. And that's all very, has to be very self-motivated and self-directed. And so some people just freak out then because they can't handle that degree of freedom and having it be on your own responsibility. Um, and I, uh, I didn't mind the responsibility. I just wasn't good at disciplining myself. Right. So I didn't mm. like freak out about the fact that it was on me, but I did get really, uh, I don't know, frustrated with myself, I guess, because I felt like I, I just didn't have the self-discipline. And so I really sort of engaged in a kind of conscious attempt to try to become more conscientious. Um, and there was, there was this one period where I just felt like, how am I wasting so much time? You know, and so I was keeping a diary of like every 15 minute increments, like, what am I doing all day? Just trying to figure out where, how I was wasting so much time. 
well, you know, guess what? Even 20 years ago, it turned out a lot of time I was just wasting on the internet. <laughs> mm, yeah. So some things, some things uh, haven't changed since the internet was invented, I guess. Um, right. You know, and but part of so I had to kind of like develop better habits, and and I also kind of had to I had to shift my priorities and shift my goals because even when I got into to grad school, I was sort of feeling like um, this will this will be a good career because I'm actually interested in this stuff, and it will allow me to have something to do and to make some money that will give me space to enjoy myself and relax and party. And because I you know when I was in when I was in undergrad. You know, I liked to party and I liked, I didn't, I didn't like to work. I enjoyed thinking about stuff. I liked the kind of intellectual side of things. But again, I was not conscientious. I didn't really, you know, I wasn't committed to, to working a lot. Um, mm -hmm. One of the, so I, my, even though I ended up in psychology, my degree was in the history of science. Uh, and so I was studying mm. psychology from a historical perspective. Um, and then one of the requirements of that degree is whatever you were studying historically, you had to do some, you know, contemporary classes as well. So I started taking psychology classes, really loved the psychology classes. But part of the reason I didn't switch into psychology as my major um, was that I, I didn't want to work that hard. I didn't want to have to do labs and like have a bunch of my free time where I was, uh, you know, committed to working in a lab or something, you know, and mm -hmm. like now I look back on that and I think, well, that was stupid. Uh, this is because this is what you are interested in. And, you know, and I'm lucky that I ended up getting to do it anyway. And when mm -hmm. I talk to students now, undergrads, I, you know, I tell them, yeah, definitely you want to volunteer in a lab and you want to find, uh, you want to find lab work that interests you. And that's part of, is, I think it's also gotten harder to get into grad school since I was in college in the mid nineties. And so, you know, it, I, I don't advise people to follow my path, but that's, that was where I was. And I really had to adjust my priorities to be like, okay, my main goal is not to like have fun in life and have a job that allows me to support the fun. My main goal is to be a successful psychologist and to do interesting science and interesting psychological research. And, you know, and, if, and then if I have some time left over to have fun, well, you know, that's great. But I saw, you know, I had to kind of shift our, the way that my goals were prioritized and that then mm. helped me to be motivated in the right way and to develop the effective habits to uh, to start to learn how to get work done better and to be more industrious. Um, That's and this oh, I, uh, well, I was just going to uh, continue. Well, I was gonna I was gonna tell this funny story because uh, when I was in grad school, so uh, right when I was you know in my second year, maybe when I was having this real frustration with myself about not getting things done. And, um, I found online, a, a big five test and where you took the test and then it would tell you what your percentile scores were. Um, and everything looked like normal, like what I would have expected, except my conscientiousness score was minus 17. And I was like, what the <laughs> hell is that? There's no such thing as a negative percentile. <laughs> like, I was so, it's like percentiles go from zero to a hundred. You can't have a negative percentile. <laughs> it's like, That's I felt like amazing. it was insulting me. Um, and then I, I, I figured out eventually why that happened. It was that they weren't literally adding my score into their database and then calculating the percentile. They had some, you know, what they call a normative sample. You know, they probably had mm. a few thousand people who had taken the test. And then they created an algorithm to estimate what somebody's percentile was based on, you know, age and sex and what the range of scores was. Um, and so anyway, my score was so low, essentially, that it broke the algorithm, right? That it was yeah, like estimating yeah. a, at a negative number. I'm so happy that you sh shared all, all of this. And the reason it is, is because it's, well, a lot of reasons, but uh, people love hearing personal stories and everything else. But I, I think that there is, I think that I, I probably have a lot of, uh, I have a lot of listeners that are probably in the same sort of boat that I am that are uh, great thinkers, super just naturally inquisitive and maybe not the most conscientious people in the world. And and it's because I always I always see things like conscientiousness correlating with uh with life success or or success in academia and stuff and and. It's just so discouraging for me every time I see those things as I'm like, ah, I'm doomed. I'm, I'm, how did yeah. I even make it this far? And, uh, and I mean, it does, it does have a heavy cost. Some, some days it's, it's very, 
it, I mean, you notice it when when stuff piles up and you don't attend to things and everything yeah. else. But so anyway, it's it's thank you so much for sharing that oh, um, yeah. because and it's, I mean, it's I, nice know, I think, to hear. Right. I, in, in a lot of ways, it's very fitting with this. We're talking about well-being, right? Because this is this mm-hmm. idea that one of the ways that you might improve your well-being is to try to change some of these basic aspects of our personality that we struggle with. You know, and so the, you know, the good news, I guess, is that my conscientiousness did go up a bit over time. So actually, I went back to that website. I made it a habit then every year after that, uh, like around my birthday, I would go and, do, and take the test again and try to be really honest about it. Yeah. Um, and the second year that I did it, um, my score was minus one. And I was like, okay, oh. okay. It's, it's still <laughs> negative, but it's better. It's not minus 17. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then the, and then the, following, great year, idea. It, the following year was actually in positive numbers. Um, and then like, you know, a couple of years after that, that website disappeared. And so I couldn't go back and try it again, but you know, it's mm. like, uh, it, I, so I was actually able to get more conscientious, um, over time. And that is one of the traits that psychologists are now actively working to develop kind of systematic interventions for, you know, like a, a, a program. We know that, uh, psychotherapy, uh, all different kinds, like whether it's talk therapy or whether it's uh, CBT uh, or whether it is you know, pharmaceutical therapy, um, all of those tend to change people's levels of neuroticism. Um, mm. I mean, on average, right? Like we know that for every therapy, it works for some people, it doesn't work for others, but there are now a lot of studies and uh, there was a really nice meta-analysis that came out of a few years ago uh, that uh, Brent Roberts and his group did And they showed that uh, these interventions do tend to change people's personalities. Uh, And the trait that changes the most is neuroticism. So, you know, not surprisingly, people who are in therapy for one reason or another, one kind or another, tend to have anxiety, depression, a lot of negative emotion. And that uh, therapy tends to improve that. And it improves the sort of general tendency that people have. Um, mm. And it, it, you know, it moves the other traits a bit too often, but less dramatically than neuroticism. Um, but now psychologists are really actively working to try to develop specific interventions uh, for other traits. And the one that I've seen people focus on the most is conscientiousness. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I like that idea because there's also isn't isn't therapy starting to go a little bit of the direction of or I think isn't I, I'm not super familiar with cognitive behavioral therapy, but isn't it a little more um, uh, like, I don't know, active therapy or so, like rather than talking through something kind of prescribing, taking action and building new habits? Yeah. Uh, um, CBT, is, cognitive behavioral therapy, it tends to be focused on sort of concrete strategies that you can use to improve things in your life. And some of those are behavioral strategies. Some of those are cognitive strategies, right? So it's like, for example, uh, if you are in the habit of catastrophizing, like whenever something goes wrong, you immediately leap to what the worst possible outcome is and how this is going to ruin everything. You know, it's essentially teaching you, trying to teach you new cognitive habits and catching yourself when you're doing that uh, and, you know, not catastrophizing, not leaping to the worst possibility. And so, you know, that's just one example of the kinds of st- cognitive strategies um, but mm. yes, yeah, so if you do CBT, they're going to teach you various strategies. They're going to give you homework, <laughs> things to do. So it's, yeah, it's more, it's less kind of like, uh, unstructured delving into what your problems are and what your, uh, you know, past history of trauma is and more like focused on how you can change your behavioral and cognitive habits in ways that are going to, uh, that are going to be good for you. Um, and then, you know, there's, but there are all kinds of these things. There's, uh, ACT. Uh, DBT, there are all these three letter acronyms, whatever, uh, for whatever reason. So DBT is a dialectical behavioral therapy. And that's really focused on basically the way in which so getting you to really be more mindful and aware of the way in which you interact with other people. And you'll do things mm-hmm. like, uh, sort of role play being in the, in the other side of a dialogue. And so it's really, you know, so there are all these different types of therapy that are all aimed at slightly different types of problems. And, you know, I, people shouldn't feel like they need to pick one. You, you know, you should try from the uh, variety of different tools that are out there, I think. And a lot, a lot of therapists are kind of eclectic in that they will draw on 
um, they'll draw on strategies and therapies from these different traditions. Mm. Um, so as we get into this, uh, this new publication, I was wondering, uh, as you, you mentioned, you, uh, uh, you, what'd you say? You got a degree in the history of science early yeah, on? That's right. that your... yep. That's my, my undergrad, so, my, my BA is in the history of science. So I, I just saw as I, again, I skimmed very, I'm a terrible student, but, um, <laughs> but very interested nonetheless. Um, but I saw you had a little bit of his, the history of well being mm -hmm. research. I, and I don't want to put you on the spot if you can't recall every bit of it off the top of your head, but I think listeners would be really interested in that. Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to talk about that a little. And yeah, I've been working on this a lot over the last year or two. So I, that is, that's pretty fresh in my mind. Um, right. and, and part of this is because, uh, my collaborator in this project is Valerie Tiberius, who's a philosopher here at the University of Minnesota. Um, and she, her main focus is well being. And mm. she has a theory of well being that she's developed, which is called value fulfillment theory. Um, and we've been friends for a long time and we sort of for a long time we're looking for opportunities to collaborate on things together and at some point we were talking and realized that the way that i think about personality and my sort of general theory of personality and her theory of well-being were really well aligned um and so we decided to take her theory which is you know sort of aimed at philosophers and written in a philosophy tradition and try to turn it into something that works as a scientific theory in psychology um and so mm. what we've basically done is taken her value fulfillment theory, and I'll explain what that means in a minute, and connected it to my uh, cybernetic theory of personality, which is all cybernetics is the study of the way in which uh, goal-directed systems work, right? And humans are goal-directed systems. Um, and so uh, people would do well to remind themselves of that yeah. more often i feel no like. it's absolutely true like i i often find i will have what I, I will be in a mysteriously bad mood uh and i will think to myself like why yes. am i feeling crappy and i'll think like there's nothing really pressing me right now i don't have any real stressors and then i will realize that like, even though I've decided that I didn't need to work on this particular thing, uh, you know, for another week, just the mere fact that it's there waiting for me is like, once you set a goal for yourself, you might do that consciously and intentionally, but then your un the unconscious parts of your uh, brain machinery kick in and they monitor yes. whether you're making progress toward that goal or not. And if yes. you're not, uh, and especially if you're like trying to relax and not making progress toward some other goal, you know, your brain's throwing this error message, not necessarily Ugh. consciously, not intentionally, but you're just kind of feeling dissatisfied. And if you probe that, if you really pay attention to it, you may, you may realize that it's because you're not making progress on something, even though consciously you may have told yourself, I don't need to make progress on that right now. Or like that. Can yeah. Wait. Oh, yeah. what a perfect example, man, that hits home for me because I, I, I have a tendency, especially when I'm hypomanic to, plant a few too many seeds, uh, you know, and then I, and then when I no longer have the energy to tend to the garden, it's things fall apart and the weeds grow and everything else. Right. But one of the things that I do, and I was, man, I was just talking about this on my other show, Mind Under Matter. I, this is this pattern where actually things are going great. Things I am super productive. I'm not burning out. Things are just going great. And I just decide like, you know, I've been working. I've been getting so much done over the last month. I just need to take a few days off and have a few. I just need to kick up my feet a little bit. And so, not always, but sometimes that's actually when things fall apart for me, um, because I whatever I did with my with my goal directed behavior and the goals that I set for myself, I I was kind of on this on this pattern and right. I, my my inner worlds, my, uh, my subconscious was able to kind of predictably rely on getting X amount done and moving this much closer toward those goals on a given day. And it felt great. And then 
I watch a little TV and next thing I know I'm binging a show in which a lot of people do healthily. But for whatever reason, when I binge shows, I just like feel completely awful. I don't watch that much TV because it's a drug that I don't handle well. And, uh, and it, and then just like things fall apart so fast and it's not from like a burning out and it's not from like a low, uh, uh, um, emotional state or anything it's just i took my foot off the gas a little bit and something funky like exactly what you described right happens to me right and it can be it, that's that's part of why it can be hard to relax if you're in a real you know working groove and after i finally got uh you know a little better at, at working hard when i was in grad school i saw i remember um i was working on this project and there was some money associated with it and the the professor i was working for was like find a good conference to go to to present this stuff uh you know th that we've been working on and i felt very smug because i i found this conference in crete uh, and i was like i'm i'm going to crete and it's somebody else is paying for it um yeah and and it was and I, and it was it wasn't something i was even interested in particularly it was just related to this project that i was getting paid to work on and it was on human computer interactions and so my thought was, well, you know, I'll go and present my thing and then skip the rest of the conference and go to the beach. Um, <laughs> and so I did that. And it, but it like the first couple of days and I was just lying around on the beach and enjoying myself, I sort of wasn't enjoying myself. I kept feeling agitated and like, I, like I needed to be doing something. And I was like, what is going on? Because I wasn't yeah. really, you know, having been a kind of uh, goof off when I was younger, I, you know, I wasn't necessarily used to that feeling of being really engaged in right. work. And, and then after a couple of days, I was like, my brain calmed down again. And I was like, oh yeah, now I'm, now I'm really just enjoying the relaxation. Um, you know, but it definitely took like a day or two to get out of that mode of being on all the time in terms of what's, what's the work, what's the work. Um, mm -hmm. and so, yeah, so there's two things. There's that sense of like, uh, needing to be working when maybe you don't. And then there's also the sense of like you you thought you were able to put something down for a while and you weren't right you mm -hmm. you consciously decided i don't need to work on this for a while but it didn't uh, but you know it, your you kept you know your brain kept monitoring it or like it could be even even if you let's say that it's something like let's say i feel like uh you know i'm working i know i should be working on it a little more but it's going all right and i'll get there eventually i've still got plenty of time like rationally, I don't think it's a good reason to feel bad, but I do feel bad anyway. <laughs> right, like sometimes, right. Sometimes we misjudge the extent to which something like that is going to make us uh, is going to make us feel bad. Exactly. Yeah, I think that's such a major issue because. Yeah, it's so. That's the other tricky thing. It's so. The the other importance of thinking of yourself as this like goal oriented organism uh, out there, you know, that with social needs, with the recognizing status, uh, acquiring mates, retaining mates, child rearing, avoiding disease, uh, avoiding danger, uh, is is that otherwise. Like if you ask someone what they want or what will make them happy, like people, and I'm including myself, I'm I'm a people. People don't know a lot of times. Like what right. what you think will make you happy or what you think will you don't want to do or will make you miserable or you wouldn't like or whatever else. Like it's really hard to put your finger on if you're just judging things from what your consciousness is telling you. Right. <laughs> right. It's hard to figure out what you should value in yeah. life. And that's kind of the, that's kind of the core of our recommendations for how you should improve your well being. Uh -huh. It's essentially all about, um, it, it, it's about recognizing that you don't necessarily know everything that you value. Uh, right. And, it's possible to explore that basically essentially exploring the unconscious, you know, it sounds, sounds like very Freudian or something, but in fact, uh, you know, there's a lot, the brain is doing a ton of stuff that we are not consciously aware of. Consciousness is like a thin layer on the surface of what your brain is doing. Yeah. Uh, and it's very powerful in some ways in terms of its capacity to integrate things and pull them together and allow you to, you know, perceive complex relationships and plan for the future. Um, but 
it's very unpowerful in the sense that it doesn't have a lot of access to what is going on under the surface. And you are basically often guessing about, you know, why you did what you did, why you feel the way that you feel, uh, wh why, what your motivations really are. We just don't have uh, direct access to that. And there's so much lost in translation, you know, consciously we're using these fancy words and we're saying, I'm going to use this great communication stuff that I have. I'm going to say, Shane, clean up your room and <laughs> exercise today. There, my brain yeah. heard me say that. And then your subconscious is trying to communicate through you with a feeling of excitement or boredom or anxiety or or, or whatever else. These these like kind of much at, at least the way that it um the the kind of quality of the feeling uh, consciously it's it's so vague kind of right, trying right. to and decipher I think that's the right. code like the, the, those are the those are the channels like one of the one of the channel uh, to get at things that you don't consciously understand yet is emotion um yeah and the other channel is something like fantasy or imagination right it's like what pops into your head when you're daydreaming or you know, this is why Psychotherapists will often want to analyze, you know, will often focus on people's dreams and analyze people's dreams because your 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 brain is full of all these associations. It appears that what dreaming is is basically a way of uh, looking for connections uh, in your memories that are not, that are maybe too far out to be worth paying attention to while you're awake, but might still be useful. Right. So this, this sort of associative process that builds this thing that, that comes out as dreams, basically. So it's like mm -hmm. all these different ways that you can try to get at, well, what do you, how do you feel about this? How do you feel about that? What are the kinds of connections that you're making in terms of emotional associations or analogies between this and that? And are you mapping this situation onto that previous situation and things that you may not be consciously aware of? So, you know, pay attention to where your imagination goes, pay attention to where your fantasies go, pay attention to what your emotional states are. That's really like the best way that we have to try to figure out more about what we really want, right? What we mm -hmm. really value and what might work for us as a set of values. I, I also, I, I find that for for me personally, I, I really think that fantasy grand like exceedingly salient um imagery within the mind's eye is a really nice way of capturing something and then figuring out okay now what's what's the nuanced mesh message that that was trying to pull out trying to communicate like if, if you're if you're playing a game of charades and you uh you you pull the the card and it says anger and you're trying to demonstrate anger to people as in five seconds time you're going to use this exaggerated you know and, and right. no one actually is ever that angry as you're going to do the charades version <laughs> like <laughs> you know it's such a cartoon version and i feel like the mind's eye is sort of like that as well for any dreams any any like um you know imagining being homeless or or dying or or whatever else some of those things can can be little hints that you're off uh, on on a go uh, on on your goals or or heading in the right direction and and it just mm -hmm. it just doesn't it doesn't feel very nuanced the way you're experiencing it, but I think being mindful of it, of it, you if if you look below the sur surface of those things, there there's a lot more subtle things going on there that can really um, help you understand yourself more. Yeah, absolutely, I entirely agree with that. Um. So yeah, history of wellness. Yeah. Oh. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, uh, sorry. <laughs> right. No, no, that's fine because, right. So this is, I mean, it's a good way to get back to that is that, so we've got this idea that what you need to do for uh, well being is to figure out what the appropriate values are and then mm -hmm. fulfill them. Um, and then the question is, how does that fit into other conceptions of well being? And so if you look at the history of 
philosophical thinking of well-being for the last couple thousand years or more, um, what you see is, uh, so philosophers have basically divided up the ideas about well-being into three basic camps. You've got one that is hedonism. Um, and, you know, colloquially, we think of hedonism means like you want to, like, you know, uh, uh, Party, do all do the drugs, drugs and bang drugs people and, rock and, and roll, stuff. Right? Yeah. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll is hedonism. But what the philosophers mean is something a lot more sophisticated than that, which is that what is good for you is what makes you feel good. It's what makes you have an ex- a sense of pleasure and an absence of displeasure or pain, right? Mm. So, uh, And so, you know, maybe uh, working extremely hard and being self-sacrificing is what makes you feel good. Like a hedonism can... A, can uh, accommodate that in the philosophical perspective. But nonetheless, what they're tying it to is your subjective sense of, uh, of happiness, of satisfaction, of feeling pleasure. Um, and that is probably the most common way to look at well-being in psychology as well. It's referred to as the hedonic tradition. And so it's basically what you'll see as the most common measure of well-being is essentially just how satisfied are you with your life? How much, how happy do you feel? It's like your positive emotion, your positive emotion minus your negative emotion and then you know plus your judgments of your how satisfied you are with your life Mm -hmm. Uh, that is the main way that that psychologists look at well-being it's pretty i mean it's very intuitive you know i i I think that's probably the default way that most people would think about Mm well-being it's very intuitive but it has some problems right Uh, okay so for one thing uh Life satisfaction, it turns out most of the variation in that can be predicted from that combination of positive emotions minus negative emotions. Mm-hmm. So your judgments about your life satisfaction are seem to be really pretty heavily dependent on your emotional experience. Again, not surprising at all. Um, but at the same time, we also know that people's emotional tendencies have a lot of uh, genetic contribution to them, and they're pretty stable over time. Like, as we were saying, these personality things can change, but they don't tend to change dramatically, and they're pretty stable over time. Um, mm-hmm. And so what that means is that if you're the kind of person who's just naturally disposed to experience a lot of negative emotion, by that definition of well-being, it's very, very hard for you to be deemed to have a good life and to be and to have well-being from that psychological perspective um and philosophers a lot of philosophers have thought that's a problem as a psychologist i think that's a problem partly because i'm focused on personality traits so i don't want to say that you know uh shoot i used to always use woody allen as an example of the neurotic but you know that's not that's less popular now that uh he, <laughs> yeah. uh, he, all of those uh, accusations were leveled against him but who's, whatever who's like the that guy that's that he, on yeah i mean people get it who, those who's kinds that, of characters right it's like who's, who's they, that guy on curb your enthusiasm um that oh, was like uh, the old uh comic yeah, yeah uh, uh, um, who, who was the producer for seinfeld um yeah uh, yeah Larry, uh, 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 well, uh, Larry, okay, well, whatever. well, we Larry, Larry, Larry David, but no, the, but there's one of his friends. It doesn't matter. We're getting, <laughs> we're getting distracted. Right. Uh, whatever. All we're trying to talk yeah. about is the fact that you can imagine somebody yeah. who is, you know, generally fairly neurotic. They know they experience a lot of anxiety. They, they know they're prone to dissatisfaction and yet they've accomplished a lot of things in their life that they value. Uh, they feel like uh, that, they may be unhappy, but what they value in life, they are able to fulfill, mm. right? And so one of the things that that means is that they are not necessarily overly attached to being happy, right? So like if I really value just being in a pop, happy, bubbly mood and, and, you know, and I'm like Larry David or Larry David's character, like I'm not going to be able to fulfill that in life probably, right? right? But if on the other hand, I say to myself, well... I know that I'm going to be feeling grumpy and uh, and dissatisfied a lot of the time, but I'm not going to let that stop me from accomplishing the things that I think are important in life and for having the kinds of relationships that I think are important uh, and for, you know, maintaining the uh, sort of abstract principles like honesty or whatever that I think are valuable. And I think you can imagine somebody who is able to do all of that stuff, even if they have frequent experiences of anxiety or dissatisfaction. And we might still want to say that they had led a good life. It's like, look at all the things that they accomplished. Look how they were able to stay true to their principles. 
uh, you know, look at what they did for their friends right. and the relationships that they cared about. Right. And so one of the things that our theory allows basically is for people who are, uh, for people who have, let's say, unfortunate personalities, uh, to still achieve well being because they are able to, you know, essentially accept the parts of themselves that they can't change that old cliche. Um, although I guess it's usually accept the things in life that you can't change, but I think particularly important are accepting the things about yourself, uh, that you might not be able to change, you know, mm. and so maybe, maybe you work on them a little bit. Maybe they change a little bit, right? Like I got a little bit more conscientious. I'd still like to be more conscientious, but like in general, it's working for me. Right. Mm. And so the idea is that you can essentially work around your flaws, right? Work around the things that you don't like about yourself as long as you're willing to give yourself a little slack in some domains and to develop habits and strategies that essentially compensate for them. You might still be able to actually fulfill the things that you value in life and that you feel are important. Uh, mm. And so that, that ties into a different school of thought in the history of thinking about well-being, uh, which is known as desire satisfaction theories, right? So there's hedonism, uh, there's this desire satisfaction uh, school of thought. And so the simplest version of desire satisfaction is just that what's good for you is whatever is getting whatever you want. Now, any psychologist is going to tell you what the problem with that is, right? Because sometimes we want things that aren't good for us. Right. Um, and so what Valerie's theory does is that it says that it's not just about fulfilling any desire. It's about having an appropriate set of values, which are like a more sophisticated form of desire and then fulfilling those, right? So a value needs to be an appropriate value anyway, it needs to be integrated in the sense that uh, you have a cognitive understanding of it that jives with your emotional reaction to it uh, and your sort of general sense of motivation toward it. And so there's kind of a coherence there. There's not conflict within yourself. Right. You know, just if your desire is to drink 10 beers and you think, well, that, that'll be good for my well-being from a desire satisfaction perspective. Well, no, because that's probably going to conflict with other things that you care about. Right. And so part of this is getting an integration of your various goals, your various values, because the value is really just another way to say a goal, right? Some, a goal mm. that's reasonably persistent over time and that you're committed to in some way. Mm. Um and so, you know, that can range from something relatively concrete all the way up to the very abstract principles. Mm. And so we think that taking this kind of more sophisticated desire satisfaction approach would actually be good for psychology and would solve some of the issues around this kind of traditional hedonic approach. Now, there's a, the third school that we haven't gotten into is the is in psychology. It's called eudaimonic. Um in philosophy, it's usually referred to as objective list theories. Mm -hmm. um, the reason it's called eudaimonic is that the most famous uh, figure in the history of objective list theories is Aristotle. Uh, and Aristotle talked about uh, the good and well-being uh, with the word eudaimonia. Um, and the people have translated that in a variety of ways. It gets translated in terms of uh, it often gets translated as happiness, but since we usually think in this culture of happiness as just like positive emotion, that doesn't actually work that well. Uh, probably a better way to think about eudaimonia in Aristotle's terms is uh, as flourishing, um, and even more specifically as essentially fulfilling our human nature. Um, and you know, Aristotle thought that the, the the only really optimal way to fulfill your human nature was through essentially uh, moral action and and philosophical inquiry. So you know, he might have been a little biased. Uh, right. But the way that psychologists have taken this up and you know, more modern philosophical approaches to this is basically to say that there is a list of certain qualities and experiences that people need to have to achieve well being. Um, and so the most famous of these in, uh, in psychology is Carol Riff's theory. Uh, and it, she, there's a list of, uh, six different things that people should have in order to have well being. And I'm not going to be able to rattle them all off, off the top of my head. Um, but they're things like, you know, self, self actualization, good relationships, you know, but at any rate, the idea is that there's just this objective list that you can specify that these are the things that if people have, they have well being. Um, and, uh, so 
in the the eudaimonic tradition in in psychology, you either get a list like that, or you get a focus on a, a couple of more specific things, like having meaning in life or having purpose in life. Like you'll often hear about that as like an alternative to experiencing happiness and satisfaction. Uh, no, you need meaning and purpose, or maybe you need both, right? Because the objective list sometimes includes uh, ha happiness and you know that kind of hedonic satisfaction, but then it also includes these other things. Um, you know, and in general, I think. There's nothing wrong with those lists. They usually manage to focus on things that are important for most people. Um, but we think our theory is preferable because it's a bit more flexible, because what we recognize is that there's not necessarily the same list for everyone of what you should value or what you need. Mm. People have different personalities. They have different circumstances. And those differences in their personalities and circumstances may shape what are the appropriate values for them. Uh, so, for example, I, I, I like to use this as an extreme example. One of the things that's been identified as a basic human need by psychologists is affiliation uh, or need to belong or need for relatedness. These are all talking about the same basic need to make connections with other people and to have satisfying, warm relationships with other people. And yes, I think that that is pretty central to human life for almost everybody. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and it might be universal in the sense that even somebody who grows up to be a hermit and doesn't want to have any human connection probably was connected to their primary caregiver when they were an infant and a very small child, right? So there is something about that mammalian bond between the, you know, the, between parent and child um, that is probably, I agree, it's, it's a universal thing for human beings. But if we look at adults and to take that example of the hermit, here's the person who is genuinely most happy in life, living off in the woods without, you know, self-sufficient, no contact with other people. Um, am I really going to say that they can't have a good life because they are not forming a lot of good relationships? Um, you know, is that person really secretly like men mentally ill? No, I don't want to say that. I want to think that might just be a really unusual person who has a very low level mm -hmm. of this need for relatedness, almost in adulthood to the point of non-existence. Uh, and so our value fulfillment theory essentially allows each person to have their own unique set of values. Mm. And even among those values that are essentially universal, like relatedness or like the need for autonomy, we allow people to have different priorities on them, right? Because the important thing is not just fulfilling all your values, because, you know, I would love to be a great guitar player. Okay, I, I, I tried to learn the guitar when I was like high school and college and just didn't have any knack for it. Um, but I, you know, I love a lot of guitar music. I love improvisational music. I wish that I could play guitar, but I'm not going to say that my life has not gone well if I don't actually learn to play guitar well, because I've just way deprioritized it. So even though in the abstract, I still like it, I sort of, I kind of value the idea. I don't really value playing the guitar. It's not important for me. I've massively deprioritized it. So the important thing is to understand what somebody's hierarchy of values are. What are the things that they think are important? What's at the top? Um, and then the question is, are they actually fulfilling those values? Are they moving toward them? Um, and so in some ways, it's like a perspective that you can only totally see at the end of somebody's life. Like, did they fulfill their values? Um, but we can think a lot about what people are like during their lives in terms of do they have an appropriate set of values and are they making progress toward them? And so the thing about having an appropriate set of values means you have to look for conflicts. Um, you also have to look for cases in which people might value something unconsciously and not be aware of it. And so that they have a set of values that conflict with this other value that they don't really know about. Like you can imagine somebody who's not a, a happy hermit, uh, who is, I don't know, you know, like, says to themselves, I don't need a connection to other people. Like, that's just not that important to me. I'm focusing on my work right now. That's what's really important to me is I'm going to leave this legacy that's, that is about all about my work. Um, you know, I don't really need to worry so much about having a lot of human connections. And, you know, it's easy to imagine somebody like that who we would essentially judge as being deluded, like that they are a lot less happy in their lives than they should be or that they mm. could be. And they're doing a lot less well because at an unconscious level, they really do value connection to other people and they're just essentially suppressing that or ignoring it. Mm. Um, so not necessarily the case, right? But I think we can all, uh, you know, we've all encountered people who seem to have that vibe where they're like determined to be 
disconnected from people, whereas what you sense is that at some level that's a defense mechanism or they're making a mistake or they're screwing up their priorities because they would really benefit from being more connected. Um, mm -hmm. And you, you can you can go to the flip side. You can say, here's somebody who has decided that all they really care about in life is uh, you know, being happy, go lucky and being good to other people and being well connected to other people, right? They don't think they need some kind of higher purpose or goal that they're working for. They don't need a, a, a career. They're just going to like putter about earn some money on the side. So it's great by making a living because what they're really dedicated to is, you know, helping others and being good friends with others and being connected to others. Well, we might look at that person and see that you have this kind of lingering sense of un unease and dissatisfaction. And maybe it's because, or like, and maybe you don't even... You know, maybe right. you don't even recognize that, but things just aren't going as well as they could be. And maybe what you really need actually is something like a bit more of an organized uh, career goal instead of just totally devaluing that side in term and focusing on uh, on your relationships. Right. So we're not trying to prescribe any one of these things, any one of these possible values as like the right thing for everyone. We're just mm. trying to say that people need to figure out what their set of values should be, how they should prioritize them how they can develop a set of values that is coherent in the sense that they're not uh, at odds with each other. You know, and sometimes we have to make compromises, right? Like it's like, I want to have, uh, I don't know, I want to be a professional musician, but I also want to have a family and I also want to pursue uh, some other, you know, this other hobby. Well, how is that going to work, right? Like I might have to lower my ambitions in relation to one of those in order to make the other one work. So it's not like, it's not like saying like, if you can't do this all the way, you have to throw it out. It's more like saying you have to develop your, the, the standards that work for you in a way to make your various values fit together with each other. Um, mm. and you know, and you can talk about it all in the realm of values, but underneath the hood, what you're talking about is these cybernetic processes of pursuing goals. Your brain is monitoring what your goals are and how you're pursuing them. Um, mm -hmm. and so if you've got a bunch of goals that are, that conflict with each other, it's going to notice. Right. And it's going to say, like, I'm doing this. I'm not doing that. That's going to, you know, that's going to throw out error messages. Um, yeah. And even if those error messages don't register consciously in negative emotion, you're still essentially suboptimally functioning. That's man. I love I love everything. I know I don't have you for much longer here, but that that's uh, that's that's really cool. Maybe. Maybe I'll have you back on um, again sometime soon to talk about this because I feel like this is an endless conversation. I think even even just in terms if you if you go up and survey people on the street and ask them what they want in life, most people are going to be like, I want to be happy. And um, <laughs> most people aren't sitting there thinking like, well, what was I built for evolutionarily? Was <laughs> right. it for happiness? You know, um, like, uh, like not, if, also if, not that we should necessarily be slaves to evolution. Right. Like, so, for example, right, right. Uh, you know, there was that there was that attempt to redo Maslow's hierarchy and put like, you know, mating and child rearing at the top. is like the most important goals. But right, I don't right. I think that's a big mistake uh, right. because, it was, well, for a couple of reasons. One, uh, evolution doesn't necessarily care about. OK, here's the, here's the way this works. Right. Like, so evolution doesn't have to make you want children. It just has to make you want sex. Right, 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 right. So it's not necessarily the case that everyone has a goal built into them to have children. Right. Uh, you know, people have the goal built into them to want sex, and that's how evolution gets you to, to procreate. Right, and, you know, right, humans right. came along and invented birth control and screwed the whole system up. <laughs> right. Yeah, but, I, I mean... You know, I, but that's I a good guess... illustration of the fact that, like, we don't, we shouldn't think that what is natural is good, right? That's the classic naturalistic fallacy. Right, fallacies. right, right. We shouldn't think that just because we evolved to uh, to do certain things means that we have to do those things in order to be happy. So we're explicitly right. separating out uh, the goals that you develop as a person from the reasons that you develop those goals in terms of evolu evolutionary fitness. Now, with that right, being right, said, right. like <laughs> you also can't ignore what evolution has likely programmed into you, right? Because right. there are, so like, you know, having, having children might not be an evolved goal, but again, like having sex probably is. And so, although there, again, of course, there's, there's a lot of differences for some people. That's not a particularly strong drive. Right. And so, right. you know, their, their values, a good set of values for them might 
really deprioritize that. But at the same time, like for most people, it's there. And if you think to yourself, well, you know, I'll be, I'm working on so much important stuff in my life that it'll be fine if I'm celibate, right? It's like for right. a lot of people, that isn't going to work. And that is precisely because, you know, evolution put a lot of stuff in there that you can't just jettison. Um, so in the right, same way right. that, you know, evolution made you care about being affiliative with other people, evolution made you care about uh, whether your situation is predictable or not. Evolution made you uh, most likely care about sex, right? So, yeah, so I think my guess is I cut you off, but where I'm guessing you were going with that is to say, like, don't ignore the things that you likely value because you evolved to value them. Yeah, and well, also also just I, I, I just think that that to say I want to be happy is too general and too simplified for a, a goal real without without teasing apart well what does that mean to me I, I was I was I was more making I was I was going to be making comment on on the flexibility of your system I think yeah. being really important because it, especially what came to my mind was just lifespan development and and the way in which goals can like puberty is a fantastic example of how goals can flip on their head really quickly but <laughs> yes. but the same thing happens i'm 41 um you know and and uh, things happen when when you have children when you get married these things change all the time and and at at the age that I'm at right now, you know, I was a huge adrenaline junkie um, my whole life. And that was my idea of, of happiness was this really visceral excitement. And now it's, you know, starting to teeter more into that fulfillment stuff. I read about it ahead of time. I saw it, I saw it coming, didn't quite believe it, but it is, you know, uh, going so so what I love about the flexibility is because it's it's going it's going to change through your life. It's going to change through different jobs that you have, through different environments that you find yourself in. What's going to make you happy going to someone's house party versus going to a bar mitzvah versus being by yourself watching some TV versus being at work. Uh, you know, it is those are all the it's it's just changing constantly all of the time. And uh, and so to be it, to be like, I just want to be happy. It's like, well, that's, that's confusing. Uh, right. And it doesn't provide much information about how to get there. Right. Right. So, well, anyway, this is fantastic. I'd love to have you back on maybe who's, who's your co-author? Again? Valerie Tiberius. Um, maybe you guys could both come on together sometime and, yeah, that'd be fun. and chat sure more about she, this. That'd be uh, super cool. If I have, be up I have for to it. go. Off. I, I'm actually, and when we get off this call, I'm going off to uh, sit down with her and talk about how we're revising our paper. <laughs> oh, awesome. Well, Sorry, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, well, I look forward to maybe meeting her sometime and, and thanks for your time and glad we got these internet issues fixed. Yes. Um, hopefully that all worked. Uh, Colin, do you want to point people toward your university website or anything like that? I mean, if you just search for my name online, you'll find it. Uh, and most of my scientific publications are available on my website. Uh, the paper on well-being isn't yet because it's not it's not done. So we're hoping Ooh. to get that. Pub. We're hoping. Well, it, we did a version of it that we thought was done, and then of course we, you know, you send it to a to a journal, and it gets reviewed, and they come back yeah. and say, "Well, make a bunch of changes to it." So now we're at the stage where yeah, we're yeah. going to make a bunch of changes, and then hopefully, uh, the next version, maybe that will get published. Um, oh, cool! Well, when it gets published, maybe I'll have both of you on. That that might be yeah, a, that'd be a good, good um, a fitting a fitting time. I, and and I'm so happy that I got a sneak peek. Well, I'll let you go. Thank you so much, Colin D. Young. And thank you listeners for being such wonderful, curious people. We'll see you next week.